Okay, good afternoon. Good Labor Day afternoon. Were it not for this, where would you be today? There's a good twilight doubleheader at Yankee Stadium. Where would you be? All right. Um, it does seem strange that Labor Day comes in the second week of classes. Um, we've got a lot to do today. I'm going to try to cover the following topics. First, we're going to look at the explosive change in the world economy, which is in midstream. Uh, your handout is a snapshot of that. Uh, then we're going to look at, heads up, there's, there's a handout here, folks. Who doesn't have the handout? Okay, the, the source is up near the door here. Oh, in there. The, um, so let's get the logistics out of the way. Okay, everybody has the handout? Okay, let's begin organizing the, uh, the day's work. I will uh, begin by taking the snapshot you have in front of you and then using the data animation on the board to give you a sense of the dynamic process <coughs> which is hidden in the static diagram before you. Our real interest is in the dynamic process and the statics are uh, just like, for example, a quote on the Dow Jones for 2.32 in the afternoon. It's a moving target and the motion is what's interesting. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Uh, the second thing is to look at the dismal science of economics as conceived by Thomas Malthus, whose principal work appeared in 1798 and 1800, and which put forward a theory to the effect that nearly universal poverty was an essential and inevitable fact of human existence. Thank God he was wrong. Third, we'll look at uh, Gregory Clark's exploration of Malthus's world. Clark is the author of Farewell to Alms, which I hope all of you have begun to find your way through. It's available at Labyrinth. Uh, and Clark is something of a curmudgeon, and he offers interpretations which uh, should provoke argument. For example, uh, he interprets uh, the demography of England in the Malthusian period, before the great surge in the economy, in essentially Darwinian terms. Darwinian both with respect to uh, culture, uh, so social Darwinism, but also with respect to biology. Uh, he, he flirts with the idea that the children of the wealthy were genetically superior uh, to other children being born in early modern England, and that that fact has something to do with why the great economic surge took place first in England. Actually, more broadly, the United Kingdom. Finally, and this is a long agenda, finally, I'm going to look at economic biology and in particular at what is called the world demographic transition. The world demographic transition takes, it is, it is as nearly regular as clockwork, and it takes societies from poverty, short lifespans, high birth rates, high death rates, to 
relative affluence combined with capital, relative affluence with long lives, low birth rates, low death rates. And lurking behind the diagram before you is the confluence of the great economic surge and the world demographic transition. So 45 minutes from now, we should be at that point. The diagram on the board is the work of Swedish economist Hans Rosling, and it is a data animation. It's set up as follows. Uh, income per capita is on the horizontal dimension, and that income per capita is scaled logarithmically. Uh, I'll switch that out in a minute, but we'll start with the logarithmic scale. And on the vertical dimension, is a linear scale for life expectancy at birth. And the bubbles represent countries. The larger the bubble, the greater the population of the country. The bubbles are color-coded uh, to the map upper right. So all of the Western Hemisphere is shown in yellow, uh, Europe and North Asia in orange, and so forth and notably Sub-Saharan Africa in blue. Uh, you'll also find special interest in the green bubbles representing uh, the states of the Middle East. Now, let's just play this. It is it's a time series. It's 200 years of time series. The bubbles start here in the year 186 and begin moving. Um, yes, uh, you're going to need a mic. Let's hand it to you. Uh, do the diagonal lines indicate the interior about the circle say, say again? Sorry, do the diagonal lines... Yeah, they, they cast doubt on data. Uh, what do you, well, while, while you're on stage here, what, what do you, what'd you just see? Uh, so uh, we just watched 200 years of development for a whole series of countries. Uh, what I thought from the more interesting ones for the countries is he loud enough to hear in the back? Uh, Great. It showed a clear trend the entire time. Like there were a few uh, yellow balls that sort of, sort of started overtaking all the other countries around them and surpassing them. And also there were a few that just sort of went up and down, pretty much in the exact same uh, income per person for a long period of time. For, for some of them seemed stuck. And was it mainly yellow balls, or were there some orange balls out there? No, no, it was like the ones going up and down the most, and then in the one income per person. No, no, in the ones that were in the lead. Okay, now, uh, hand the mic to somebody else. We're just going to pass it around here and get people talking. No, no, don't hand it on. Uh, if you were going to describe to someone who wasn't here uh, what the main pattern was, taking into account the two variables, what would it be? Okay, lower left to upper right, and lower left to upper right in, since they're not here, they don't know what that means. Okay, so there is something by and large good happening in the data. Now, there are, uh, let's pass it on to Yale Egyptology here. Um, does the, is the progress with respect to biology and wealth evenly distributed or not so evenly distributed? Okay. Do any actually go backward? Okay, it's hard to ask you to remember all that with 
It's a rather complex basketball game on the screen there. Um, could we hand it on? Would, would you, uh, if you were a god or God's accountant, uh, and you are God friendly to humankind. Uh, would you say, by and large, what you're seeing there looks like s- the world getting better? Um, I would say so, because there is a general improvement, but at the same time, we see some of the other countries, mostly the purple ones, which are located in Africa. Um, I think they're blue. Is it blue? Oh. <laughs> we have. Okay. But yeah, yes. But compared to the other countries, even though overall has gotten a big shift toward the upper right hand corner, um, but some, it wasn't evenly distributed. Okay, terrific. Pass the mic straight back, please. Um, do the dots the, or the bubbles show all the inequality involved with all the people? in the world or do they mask something? Let's take, for example, the the enormous, oops, we're, look at the uh, very large light blue bubble center stage. Uh, It represents India. Um, And as far as we can tell from this graph, uh, everybody, has the same income and probably works for Wipro in Bangalore. But in actual fact, I don't know, I, do you know anything about India? Okay, good. Uh, Now, we could infer from that that the vertical side, the vertical dimension of the world economy can be thought of in two phases. One is the difference between countries measured here by mean GDP per capita and the differences within countries, which would be represented by an income curve or a wealth curve Uh, within each of the countries. And it turns out that there's quite a lot of inequality inside the bubbles, uh, and that that inequality is most pronounced in the countries which are in the early stages of getting rich. The general pattern, India is a good example, and the fiction work assigned for for the course, uh, uh, White Tiger, is about that vertical dimension and how exhilarating it is on the one hand and the crushing disadvantage it it imposes on people who aren't part of the capitalist development story. Okay, now I want to change the diagram to get a little more more finesse here. And now I have made the, uh, the income curve linear. So it no longer exaggerates movement at the low end of the scale. And what I'd like you to do is watch this process and tell me what you think you're seeing. These are the same data, just projected differently. Now watch for some shooters. <laughs> now let me do the last half of that projection once more. And then we'll try to talk about it. Could we get a mic up and going in that section, please? 
Okay, we're going to play from, let's go around 1900 here. Okay, so over here, Who, who's got the mic? Um, can you describe the path that the vast majority of the countries follow? Okay, so what, what's just been said is that the majority of the countries show modest gains in income per capita and substantial gains in longevity. So they move vertically, more or less vertically, and then they pass second base, so to speak, and turn right across the income field. Let's run it once more. And I'm going to add, pass the mic, please. I'm going to ask the next person to take a shot at what countries are the shooters, which defy what I just said. Who's got the mic? Who do you think those shooters are? Those shooters seem to be Europe and the Middle East and North Africa. Okay, but is there, what, what are the, how would you go about getting huge gains in income per capita without going through the prior step of having people live quite a while? How would you, get, what, what might make that feasible? Especially for the main countries, it seems that GDP per capita would spike. Okay, what, what, don't hold us in suspense. The green countries might have a lot of oil. oil. Okay, so the oil states, if you bracket the oil states, you've got a very general worldwide pattern of modest gains in income combined with substantial gains in public health, followed by continued gains in public health, though at a decreasing rate, combined with large gains in income per capita. Now, notice that the, the point made, made five minutes ago still holds. When I say that the GDP per capita of a country doubled in a period, does it mean that the GDP of most people in that country doubled? And, and the answer to that, can we get the mic to center? Well, let's stay, I'm sorry. Where's the mic here? There we go. Yep, go ahead. Um, not necessarily because the chart doesn't take into account income inequality within the country itself. Okay. And Let's think of the oil states for a minute. Uh, what generally happens to the uh, vast share of the lar large shares of revenue from oil extraction in the middle decades of the 20th century, which is what we're talking about? It remains concentrated in the hands of a few, like closely connected individuals, probably ruling the country. Okay, they either remain in the hands of a local elite for the most part, or they are uh, siphoned off by a large international energy company. But the vast majority of people in such a society often don't benefit very much from that. And that becomes uh, a huge issue uh, in world politics and in attitudes toward capitalism. Okay. Uh, the URL of this data, and I've, I've explored here less than 1% of its potential, 
uh, is www.gapminder, one word, small letters, dot org, not com. Uh, and it is a resource I would like you to use in the background for this course. Just out of curiosity, how many of you had used it before? Okay, the rest of you should join in. This is, uh, this is uh, the most useful uh, technique for staying awake while thinking about numbers uh, late at night that I have ever seen. It, I showed it to grandchildren ranging down to four and they all love it. All right, now this is the diagram that Clark presents at the beginning of his book. Uh, it's taken from Angus Madison spelled with two D's who is the lead researcher on everything before 1800 in economic history these days. Uh, and literally every, there are perhaps 50 books that touch on this material and every one of them is Madison reformulated, re-sliced. Uh, these are the four things I told you we were gonna do, we've done one of them. Uh, Malthus and Clark refer to the left side before uh, the Great Surge. Uh, and the biology part about the world demographic transition concerns the movement across from left to right, which stands behind these changes. Okay, now, Malthus and the logic of perpetual po poverty. Uh, Thomas Malthus was a Cambridge wrangler, he, that meaning he was at the very top of the student body at Cambridge. He was a fellow of Jesus College. He was a devout Christian, uh, and he was a follower of David Ricardo and David Hume. He was an empiricist. Uh, he looked at the world around him and devised a simple model. And Clark makes it a good bit more complicated than Malthus does. Uh, and the reason for that is that Clark wants to make it look like contemporary economics. And the actual equilibrium story is very different from the equilibrium story in um, Microeconomics 101. The influence of David Ricardo, there were three great classical economists, Adam Smith, whom we're gonna study on Wednesday, David Ricardo, whom we're not gonna study, and Karl Marx, who, who we're gonna study in a week. The contribution of Ricardo to Malthus was that Ricardo had devised what he called the iron law of real wages. And the gist of that was that no matter what the technology, no matter what the demographics, the inflation adjusted wages pay, paid to unskilled labor would always tend toward the bottom of the scale we've been looking at, would always tend toward the level of mere survival or subsistence, as they say. And in the back of Malthus's thinking is both Ricardo's iron law and the empirics of 200 years of stagnant wages. Uh, which the English working class had experienced. So Ricardo, Ricardo's main intuition had to do with two forms of arith arithmetic um, progression. On the left, counting by hundreds, from 100 to 1,000, in the production of goods. In the center, counting by doubling at each cycle the population of the same society. And on the right-hand side, product per, per capita uh, de de derived, uh, obviously enough, by dividing the one by the other. 
And let's say the subsistence point is half a bucket per person. You then, this was Malthus's big point, that everything progresses until you get to the point where people begin to fall below subsistence level. And with a very unequal distribution of income, which was uh, inevitable in this period, as it is inevitable in the present period, or nearly so, uh, you would find a solution. Well, what would be the solutions? There are two main kinds of solutions. One, let's generate a lot more production. Let's get the scale of production to not be a linear flat line, but get it to do this. Get production to go north uh, in the same way population does. And Malthus asserted that that couldn't be done. Now we'll see, and we know in our own experience that he was mistaken. Production has done exactly that through the introduction of capital intensive production. The, the pessimism in this scenario can be linked to a correct intuition about uh, England or any other agricultural society uh, in the period from, let's say, 1200 to 1800. That's the period Clark chooses. The first thing that, is, that strikes you about this is they're not making land anymore. Only the Dutch make new land. And so you're going to deal with a fixed total of arable land. And you have, and let's assume that you have a growing population. The land mass is static, the population is growing. Let's just assume that for the moment. Uh, and, it's, and assume it's growing in a Malthusian way. And let's imagine this, uh, this is a, actually a photograph of berry pickers in Poland in the year 1909. Uh, all the visual images here, or virtually all the visual images here, come from Wikipedia Common. And since we're being filmed, that's important so that we don't violate anyone's copyright because everything on Wikipedia Common is public domain. Um, and we get, that's 70, it's a little hard to read, isn't it? We get land acre, we've got 100 units of land for this berry farm, and production increases as we increase the number of workers from 1 to 12. Uh, it starts at 50 with one worker and ends up at 174 bushels, or buckets, uh, with 12. So since the land is fixed, the marginal impact of each new worker is a little less than the marginal impact of the worker before. And the blue series uh, boils it down to uh, bushels per worker. And we have cut uh, 50 bushels to 15 bushels by going from one worker to 12 workers. Well, now this is all just made up stuff, but it captures the intuition about, about diminishing returns to intensification of labor. And the constants in this story are land and capital. We're not adding new, new land, we're not adding new capital. We're just adding new workers to an existing quantity of land. So the, the intuition that guided, guided Malthus was that as you intensified labor, you got diminishing total returns, the red arc, which implied, by perfectly simple logic, a diminishing rate of production for each worker. And that intuition is really along, that along with the iron law of wages is at the middle of Malthus's thinking. On the cultural, and who here went to a high school where you learned Latin? Ready for this one? 
Have we got, have we got a, a mic? Where's the mic for him? Okay, if none loses, no other acquires. Yeah. So the, and this was St. Thomas. And St. Thomas was expressing uh, the core conviction of classical Greece, though not Rome, classical Greece and uh, Christianity in the Middle Ages and early modern times. And all the scruples, all the rules about usury being not okay, that is, lending at interest being uh, a, viola a biblical violation, all those ideas come from this, that the total wealth produced by and for mankind, humankind, by and for humankind, is essentially a fixed quantity. So that as I get rich, the act of getting rich imposes relative poverty on others. In schematic form, we have a two-person two -person society and going away from the origin means getting richer. The budget plane is a 45 degree angle where x plus y equals a constant sum. So that movements of getting rich in either direction along that budget plane imply making others poor. And this was a deeply held assumption that the best educated and least educated alike shared. And it accounts partly for the, the underlying trope in Malthus and it tells us something about the brilliant originality of Adam Smith and his contemporaries in the Scottish Enlightenment when they said not so. And if you represent the same thing with three, my artwork is a little limited. You have to imagine that these are three dimensions like the two for me, you, and he. Um, and that we've drawn that the budget constraint as a plane here. And then you have to imagine that the green dot is on that plane takes a little imagining. I've stared at it a while. Um, but the point is this, that as you move the dot, it's impossible to make any, mo any movement which doesn't disadvantage one of the three people or more. And the, uh, the general assumption, more or less analogous to zero sumness in game theory. How many of you have done Ben Pollock's course? Uh, more or less analogous to the zero-sum theory, or to the way uh, small children think about sharing Legos, right? If I put more in my contraption, there are fewer for you to use in your contraption. That is a fundamental assumption in this whole way of looking at the world, and it corresponds to reality most of the time. Most of the time in a, a low-capital, principally agricultural economy, the world acts like this. New gold doesn't emerge. New ways of producing at much higher rates are invisible. And when we get to Marx, we'll see that he, he puts this rabbit in the hat by the way he defines the value, the exchange value and the use value of goods, he puts this zero sum condition in by the way he measures labor and uses labor to define the value of everything. So that only by imposing surplus hours of work on the, labor, on the working class can we get richer. Horse feathers, just not true. Uh, but that's for another day. Now Clark's explorations, excuse me here. Yeah, Clark, uh, who's had, who's had an, an hour or more with Clark? It's a little worrying. Um, we got a mic here?
Is it on? Um, what do you think? Do you like Clark or not like him? Okay, he's convincing, he's clear, he is empirical, right? There's some kind of a chart or table for everything. And uh, he is opinionated. He's, it's not the kind of cool dispassion that, let's say, Rick Levin might value in an economist. It's a much more uh, heated style of argument. I actually think he's sometimes a little off but he's making the argument in a really interesting way. And one of the things he does is shown in this chart, which is taken from, I believe, page 31 in his book. Uh, and this is total population on the vertical dimension, income per capita on the horizontal dimension. The red dots represent uh, estimates taken once every 10 years between 1,200 and 1,600. And they form an interesting pattern. The interest, he combines this with something else, so it's hard to find. But if you decombine it, it's almost as if there were a budget plane here. And you can move up and down the budget plane, but not through it. So that the total, it's, it's this, these dots move in a way that could be explained Malthus-wise uh, or St. Augustine wise by assuming that there is a fixed total and you, you can use it to feed more people worse or fewer people better. And indeed, if you pull out the data for the time of the Great Plague, population goes down and per capita income goes up. Now, how exact do you think our records of incomes in England in 1380 are. Okay, this is, it's a stretch to try and make this highly quantitative. Uh, but there is, it's probably not far off. Uh, he then, if you then add uh, 1600 to 1800, you get something different. And you begin to get a surge in population that does not correspond to a huge loss in per capita income. So implicit in that is the idea that we are breaking through budget planes, not in big ways, not in elegant ways, but there is something happening which takes us further and further from the central tenets of the Malthusian model. Uh, this is... Uh, Clark on real wages from 1,200 on the left to 1,800 on the right. And the spike in the middle is at least partly attributable uh, to the influence of population decline in the century before it. Uh, and I've drawn it so it looks like a much bigger mountain than it is. It's actually a very gentle swale. And you can find a version of it, no doubt, more accurate than mine in Clark. The consumption patterns of ordinary workers in this period were very modest. Uh, food and drink accounted for three quarters of spending, and I think this is pretty good empirics. Clothing and bedding, 10%, housing, heating, uh, light and soap, not much. Life was uh, pretty dark, pretty limited. The level of discretionary uh, spending was uh, very slight. There's a general rule called Engels' Law, and it's, this is not the Engels who worked with Marx, this is Ernst Engels, lived in the 1800s, that as real incomes go up, the fraction spent on food goes down. And while that's not exactly a blinding insight, it nonetheless has the advantage of being a true statement. And uh, within food, uh, the proteins, principally meat, to a lesser degree fish, uh, systematically displace starches uh, until you get uh, to our stage of gluttony. Uh, 
the most interesting piece in Clark is his handling of wealth and reproduction. And I will um, ask you to read it for yourselves, but the gist is this, that the number of surviving children produced by in each generation was greater among wealthy families than among poor ones. And it's pretty easy to think of reasons that might be true. For example, uh, money for heating your house and feeding the babies. Uh, but the, the point that Clark makes of that is more controversial. Clark wants to say that a cascade of children born at the top of the pyramid, a cascade of those children were forced to be downwardly mobile for a long period of time, populating each level of British society with adults who had begun life with the advantages of being on top. And it's easy to make up a story, which Clark does, to the effect that the uh, energetic effort you might expect from those people who had been pushed down might increase the intensity of effort and competition in the economy. He then uh, makes a series of gestures toward biological Darwinism to the effect that Britain led the Industrial Revolution because it had a disproportionate number of very able people, and the assumption here is that the rich were more able than the poor, uh, it had a disproportionate number of very able people in all the levels of the pyramid. Now, the empirics on that one are really thin. There's an awful lot of vapor in the intellectual process there. Uh, but, and this is characteristic of Clark, he's really interesting uh, in throwing out thoughts that should provoke an argument. And I should think you should be able to generate arguments among yourselves on that topic. Now, biology gone good. And I'm gonna tell this one in words and then give you the diagram. In every society, in the Malthusian phase, life is short and babies are plentiful so that a typical household might have eight or 10 children of whom perhaps three or four might survive into adulthood. And having survived into adulthood, many would die at your age or something like it. And the throughput of human beings was extremely fast. That's a way to think of it in relation to total population. Then the death rate falls. And when the death rate falls, the birth rate does not respond right away. In fact, it takes several generations, typically, for birth rates to adjust to falling death rates. The consequence of that, there were several, but the most, the most fundamental for us is that the population of the world went north very rapidly. You're having lots of babies and people are living long lives. Uh, then ultimately, the birth rate does fall. And when it falls, we have both the birth rate and the death rate at low levels. So, People live long lives and the population of their societies becomes more or less static again. It is then possible to go one step beyond that. And the one step beyond that is that the birth rate overtakes the death rate on the low side. And the society begins to do two things at once, to become smaller and to have a higher and higher fraction of very old people. And can anyone name a society that is in that stage? Yes. Japan, Japan fine. 
Uh, Japan is there. Russia is pretty much there. Much of Italy is right on the edge of that. Much of Eastern Europe is there. Uh, now the picture. This is the population surge in every continent. I'll post the slides, and I'll post them in a way that you can read them next time, I promise. Um, all the continents turn north, uh, beginning sometime after 1800. And that reflects the fact that they are in the progress of the demographic transition. Now, this is a conventional uh, representation uh, of the transition in four phases. In the first phase, we have death and birth rates somewhat unstable, but steadily high. Uh, then the death rate falls. The major cause is clean water. Clean water, uh, household hygiene, uh, a little bit higher calorie diet, uh, and at the later stages, some aspects of modern medicine. The birth rate doesn't adjust, and fa phase two consists of the period when the death rate is falling fast and the birth rate remi remains more or less constant at a high level. Then phase three, the birth rate is now stable at a relatively low level, and the birth rate is falling to meet the death rate. And then in phase four, you've got both of them at relatively low levels. Now, we come back at this point to the, pic the picture we began with. And much of what you see in this diagram and much of what you saw in the dynamic animation at the beginning of the hour uh, consists of passage through the demographic transition. And most of what you see on the left third is societies that are in stage two or early in stage three. Most of the middle is phase three where the birth rate is falling, but you're still building population. And the prediction is that we are gonna build the world population from a little under seven million to about eight and a half million uh, before you guys are my age. And mostly stage four out on the right. Now, the pertinent fact that you need to carry forward from that last little piece is this. The world demographic transition has happened in a sequential fashion. So there are temporal offsets. And societies that are in, in phase four, low birth rate, low death rate, tend to have a lot of capital and tend to be short on cheap labor. And societies that are in phase two or phase three tend to be long on cheap labor and short on capital. And the dynamic of world trade, which is such an important part of capitalism, is a way of arbitraging between early and late phases in the world demographic transition so that cheap labor is, maximizes its value by being combined with capital from phase four societies. On Wednesday, we'll come back to the 18th century uh, with Adam Smith, who is, in my view, uh, the greatest of all writers on economy and society. <laughs>